Well, I'm Mary Steffel. I think most of you know me, but um, welcome to Trinity. Thank you for coming this morning, and we have a special guest. And I want to say just a few things about him now before I turn it over to him this morning. This is, by the way, our annual Leaders in Health Management Symposium. We've done this for several years now, and we've always had uh, people who have been provocative and insightful, and it's certainly true this morning. Paul Batalden is, and, and you'll correct me, Paul, if I make something wrong. <laughs> is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics and Community and Family Medicine at Dartmouth Medical School in the, in the Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with all the good work that has come out of that unit. Um, while Paul has tr tr transitioned from a full-time faculty position and he's not um, inactive, he's on a number of boards and has a number of appointments. He's guest professor at Yom Shaping, uh, Academy for Improvement of Health and Welfare in Sweden. He's chair of the Improvement Science Development Group, the Health Foundation in the UK. He's a member of advisory board for a number of other entities, including Cincinnati Children's Health Partners in Minneapolis, John Hopkins, Quality Efforts, and many more. Uh, he is a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. A long list of accomplishments, and I'll just name a few. Key role in founding the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and in fact, the founding board chair. And yesterday afternoon, some of us heard about the birthday club and how that evolved into IHI. He's developed the National Quality Scholars Program for the VA. He's been key in the ACGME competencies and the development of those, the Squire Guidelines for Manuscripts for Quality Improvement, and the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, Health Professions Educational Collective, an interdisciplinary focus. Lots of awards. Again, I'm going to make just a few to show the diversity of organizations that appreciate and acknowledge his work. The Deming Medal from the American Society for Quality, ACGME's Award, John C. Gannett, I probably pronounced that wrong, Award, the Codman Award from Joint Commission, and the American Hospital Association Award of Honor. Um, I first met Paul uh, probably 25 years ago when he was Corporate Director for Quality at Hospital Corporation of America. And what he did is he convened a number of program directors, MHA program, asked them to come to Na Nashville to tell us what he was doing, what Hospital Corporation of America was doing at that point around total quality management. And I said, wow, you know, here is, here is a hospital company that really wants to engage the academic community. And that has been an important um, insight into my life for a long time because, in fact, the Trinity program wants to position itself right on the cusp of practice and academic. Several years ago, I had the privilege of being invited to join a, a, a community of learners, educators in nursing, in um, medicine and health administration, who gathered for a week each summer in Vermont to explore issues related to quality improvement. Paul's really an anchor for that group. It started under his um, leadership at, uh, at Dartmouth and it's continued even into the future, long after, and, and will continue long after he is no longer with Dartmouth. Um, Paul always said that the purpose of this group, this interprofessional group, was to learn about quality improvement, to learn from each other, and to change the world. And some of that I think has happened. Um, Linda Hedrick, one of Paul's projects, told me once, she said, Paul has accomplished more than we've ever known because he didn't have to take credit for it. So I'm just delighted to get you here. Thank you very much. Well, it's a challenge to manage introductions that are as gracious as that. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I regard Mary as one of the real uh, leaders in America as she understands the importance of linking learning about improving health care with the ordinary development of professionals. And that's a theme that will play into what I have to say today. What uh, I'm going to uh, 
focus on uh, this morning is a, is a model that I'd like to sort of open up uh, for your consideration. And uh, I think this model might help us create uh, sustainably improving healthcare. And I'm gonna do that by going back and forth between concrete experiences and my efforts to understand what was going on in those experiences as together we sort of build and shape this model and then explore just a little bit about the implications of that if we sort of were to take it seriously. Um, and uh, be before I get into that, and before I start describing that, I, I actually want to acknowledge uh, the, the context in which we're trying to live and work today in healthcare. And I've done that in the, in the assumptions that, that went into my thinking about uh, sort of preparing this uh, set of remarks. Um, the aims of better health and better care and best value are not new themes to anybody in this room, but they've often been pursued as projects or as uh, temporary program themes. Now we're gonna work on, and then you fill in the blank, and it's somebody's neologism or some way of sort of putting words together that makes sense as if they were gonna, in themselves, attract people to a new way of life. And this is a project, and it comes and it goes, and so on. And most of us actually would wish that these outcomes, these targets, would in fact become properties of the healthcare system, not sort of part of projects or temporary kinds of uh, initiatives that uh, would be put in front of us. And these performance and population outcomes, when they have been pursued, have usually been pursued separate from the processes of health professional development. So we have, even today, the triple aim is agnostic with respect to professional development. And so what you have are these camps, these camps of people, one camp around sort of the education of tomorrow's professionals, and another camp around improving the health system, and another camp concerned about outcomes measurement and it's like they aren't part of the same reality, and that's what I wish to challenge today. That's what I wish to sort of open, open up. And as I do that, I'm mindful that we're living in a post-sequestered reality where the assumption of scarcity is all around us. And the discourse, the social discourse, what the media is talking about, what we read about, what we hear about, what the politicians are talking about, is, is the scarcity that we have to learn to live with. And yet I think we live in healthcare in the US in an abundance of resources. And so learning to think from abundance as well as from scarcity becomes part of the task of leadership for tomorrow. And so it isn't just a matter of categorizing stuff as being short of this or short of that. One of the privileges at Dartmouth when, when um, uh, what would be that there would be lots of visitors. I mean, it's hard to get there, and so uh, people have to sort of make a plan to get there. And we had a group from Bosnia there once, and we, I, we were at dinner, at lunch, and, and the surgeon leaned over kind of sheepishly, and he said, tell me, how can you spend so much money in healthcare? And he, you know, he was sort of just curious, trying to figure out how in the world a country could do that, because it was so strange and so unusual in his experience that any country would spend that much money on healthcare. And I thought a little bit about it. And then I said, well, actually, it's easy. You guys need more categories. <laughs> and he sort of got this funny look on his face and he pulled back and then he burst out laughing because he realized that if you have enough categories, you're always short of something. And so you can always spend more to fill up the other category that you haven't got equal to the other categories. And so the, the logic of segmentation in our work, and we got a lot of different segments in what we do, it, and we, we just sort of proliferate these categories, and that's a, that's a handmade, that's a handmaid to this spending and more and more uh, that we, in fact, have to deal with. But I actually, think that the challenges that we're facing right now in healthcare are really kind of hard to 
to sort of grasp. And I like this, there are two poets. So one, one poet is a Swedish poet who won the Nobel Prize last year, Thomas Tronstormer. And he said in this poem about history, he said, every problem seems to cry out in a private language. And I thought, wow, he's nailed it. I mean, what we have is this dyslexia associated with the name of the problem over here. And then there's this problem over there. And then there's that problem. How in the world is a leader gonna make any sense of that? How are we gonna to try to put that together? And then there's this other American poet who was the poet laureate for the state of Oregon, William Stafford, who wrote this poem. And I love many of the words in this poem, so I'm gonna read the whole thing. It's not too long. So if you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others have made may prevail in the world. And following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors around us, storming out to wreck through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the circus won't find the park. These two lines, I can never really get past without. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. We know a lot about what's happening in healthcare. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give yes or no or maybe should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. I think he speaks to the way that it feels today in healthcare as we try to come to grips with what we have to come to grips with. And actually, in this room, we know a lot about what is occurring. We now need to recognize that and act. And what I want to do is to try to think together with you a little bit about what that might mean as we, as we, as we, go, uh, as we go forward. At Dartmouth a few years ago, um, we inaugurated the first health professional president of Dartmouth, Jim Kim, who was a physician. And in his opening inaugural remarks, he said, we need to develop the science of delivering value around social goals. Everybody wondered what in the world we were in for. <laughs> he was talking about a sort of in a strange way about what we were doing every day. And in the medical school, it eventually became a little clearer to us when he said that healthcare today must recognize that it is informed by three threads of scientific inquiry. The biomolecular basis of disease, clinical action to reduce illness burden, and healthcare delivery. Healthcare delivery science, one of the three fundamental threads in healthcare today. And then, he, and then he went out and found a dean of the medical school who's turning the entire curriculum around on this. Students at Dartmouth Medical School will graduate with a master's in healthcare delivery science and their MD degree when this curriculum goes into place and they start next fall. It's not slow. They are not sort of letting grass grow on this. And I was thinking back to the time when uh, science was added to Samaritanism. Walsh McDermott wrote just this masterful essay about the twin traditions underpinning modern medicine. This was an essay some years back. And he said it was the tradition of Samaritanism and science. 
And I thought to myself, I wonder what it was like when they were trying to introduce science. So I went back to the medical historical library at Minnesota Wangenstein, Owen Wangenstein's library. And uh, I started to look at what the professors of anatomy were saying when they introduced science. And these guys were trying to defend the fact that the natural condition of the femurs was curved, just, just like the great apes, that they were studying the anatomy of the lower leg with, but that the tight breeches that people were wearing had actually created a false straightness to the femurs. They were arguing against science coming into Samaritanism, and I was beginning to wonder what in the world were we in for as we started to link healthcare delivery science or social accountability into the very fabric of what it means to be a health professional, what it means to be a doctor or a nurse or a manager or an administrator. Well, uh, I think uh, up, it's always good to take a pill before it, you sort of launch into something. And the pill I'm gonna take is this one by George Box, who said, all models are wrong, some are useful. All right, so what I'm about to sort of say is wrong in some important ways, but it may be useful to you. And so it's in that context that I wish to offer. Just come on in and have a seat. And so um, uh, it, it begins this way. Um, about 25 years ago, when uh, uh, Mary and I were both in, in uh, nursery school, and we, uh, we, people were learning that better outcomes in individuals and populations, in fact, could, could occur if we worked on the way that the system that was related to those outcomes actually performed. We could make changes in that production system and produce improvements in the outcome. And people were pretty excited about that because we were linking up sort of their daily work with measured outcomes and results. And the invitations that went out, so would you like to work on improving the outcomes in your population or in this particular situation or when we admit a patient with this kind of problem or when we see those kinds of people in the community, would you like to improve that? Yeah because this is a new way. I mean, there were new tools and gimmicks and people could do process maps and all different kinds of things that they didn't do before, they didn't know anything about before. And they were kind of curious. And it was kind of fun. And uh, so it wasn't hard. The first invitation was met with, sure, I'll come. Um, the second invitation to work on the second thing, well, um, I, think, I think I could maybe do that, but the third invitation, you know, I'm really pretty busy. I, I, you know, I have a life. I, I actually have my work to do. And you want me to, in addition to work in the system, you want me to work on the system? I, I'm not sure I have time for that. I'm a busy professional. And I began to realize this wasn't gonna last. We, we, you know, we, for as long as we had voice power, we could exhort somebody to do something, but there was nothing intrinsic about this responsibility for improving the systems in which you work. And I realized that in my medical school training, you know, we went into the, the first classroom and somebody else turned on the lights. And a lot of us thought, well, I guess this is the way it's gonna be. Somebody else can always turn on the lights for me. Well, maybe I had responsibility for turning on the lights. Maybe we had to integrate this idea about work on the system and measurement of results into the formation of the be becoming a doctor or the becoming a nurse or the becoming an administrator. It had to become, in my view, intrinsic to the development of these professionals. You couldn't be a good doctor unless you worked on improving the system performance and measuring outcomes. You couldn't be a good nurse if you didn't work on that. So I had my first sort of opportunity to explain this to a dean of a medical school in Sweden at Linköping and 
the uh, CEO of, a, of a, today's number one hospital in Sweden, Rehov in, in Jönköp in Sweden. And uh, Sven Olaf, who was the CEO of the system, said, Paul, you don't understand. I, I, I live and work here. And I said, oh, wait a minute, Sven Olaf, your feet are here. Your feet are here, but that means that your eyes and your hands can be on the other corners of this triangle. And Mats Hammer, the dean of Linshipping Medical School, said, no, Paul, I work up here in this corner. That's, that's where I hang out. Yeah, okay, Mats, you can do that. But you, the reality is, if that process is not connected to the outcomes in the population, and if what you do is not connected to sort of understanding the system and making it better, you aren't preparing people for much of anything. So they looked at me and, you know, it was this kind of tolerance and wonderment about sort of whether it was really true that these things were linked. And the more I began to think about this, what I began to see was that if we don't explicitly link these things, there's nothing sustainable about this effort to try to improve care. It's only going to be one exhortation after another. It's only going to be one screaming or one attempt at some stupid incentive program that's going to sort of make it all better overnight or something like that, that's not going to work. To sustain, to sustain this, we have to integrate this, in my view, into how you become an administrator. If you're becoming an administrator and you don't know anything about outcomes measurement and you don't know anything about how to change the system to make those outcomes better, shame on you. You're inadequately prepared. And the same thing is true for nurses, same thing is true for doctors. And it's only when we, we, we recover the notion that professionals are professionals because they work on the system in which they work that we have the claim that's a legitimate claim as professionals. Well, all right, so let's push into this a little bit. So what's the knowledge that's underneath this? So I think that this, the knowledge of getting better really involves sort of a simple logic. We take we take generalizable science and we apply it to a particular setting with the expectation that we're going to have measurable performance improvement. And when I reflected on that, that's exactly what I did thousands of times in the care of patients. Only it wasn't particular context, it was particular patient. So I did it. This is, this is a simple kind of logic deal. But when I started to examine this a little closer, I realized that even though the logic is simple and there's only five elements in it, we build the knowledge underneath each of those elements very differently. So we build knowledge about the generalizable science by controlling context out as a variable. That's in the design of the study that we're using. When that knowledge is built, it's kind of dead on arrival. It lives in hard drives and journals and goes nowhere until we take it from there and apply it to a particular setting. But we build knowledge of a particular setting, not by controlling context out as a variable, but by obsessing about context. We want to know everything we can about context. What the systems are, what the processes are, how people celebrate stuff, what they don't talk about, what they lift up, what they hide. Because if we don't understand all that stuff about this context, we're not going to be successful in connecting the generalizable science to this particular setting. Two very different ways of building knowledge, two very different kinds of knowledge. They come together all the time in order to make real improvements, but it's just not those two. There's a third knowledge system, and that has to do with measured performance improvement. Here we're using the same numbers that we use for pre, post, and, and uh, comparative studies that allow us to conclude that something is effective. And uh, this often is two-point comparisons, A versus B, but this is measurement over time. Because if you're trying to improve a clinic or a hospital or a ward, you actually want to know over time the way it's performing. So time is an obligate variable here. It's not two-point comparisons, it's the way things are happening over time. So, and it's not just time that's added, because a lot of the stuff that we need to measure about whether the performance is getting better or not is uh, stuff that we don't have established measures for. 
in healthcare were full of volumetric measures, how many of this there is. And this is a qualitative measure, how good is this or how safe is this? And when you begin to start to talk that way, using measures, you have to create measures that you haven't had before. And the measurement creation process is an opportunity to take detours. You can actually create the wrong measure and screw up what you're doing by virtue of the way you're measuring it. So that if this problem of the fidelity or faithfulness of the measure, does the measure really represent what you're trying to do? So another knowledge system, but there's two more. It's the knowledge system about the plans. What's the plan for hooking it up? What's going to work here? Do we need a forcing function? Do we need an algorithm? What do we need? How, do, how are we going to make this happen? So that we hook up the generalizable science with the particular context. And then it's uh, the knowledge of execution. In, the, in this particular place, this is the way we know things work. So <clears throat> it's a simple logic, but it's really multiple knowledge systems that have to come together. It comes together every time a patient is seen, comes together every time we try to improve a place. And we need to be good at developing that knowledge because that knowledge, in fact, underpins the way in which we actually make things better. Th so th the corners don't get better without the weaving together of these kinds of ways of building and applying knowledge. But the challenge today, as Arne Milstein says, is we need to find a way to cut societal cost while preserving margins if we want to run viable institutions. It, you know, at, at uh, Henry Ford, it, uh, Ed Deming was, was uh, lecturing at, at Ford Motor Company in Detroit and something happened and the schedule was uh, gefunkus and so he was suddenly available because the guys who were going to meet him at Ford Motor Company weren't around. And so they called Vin Sani, who was at uh, Henry Ford then, and Vin hastily arranged this meeting for uh, Dr. Deming to address the boards of trustees and the leaders of the Henry Ford Health System. And so everybody was in this auditorium and they were all waiting and Deming was at that time being wheeled from place to place. He was in his 90s and he was being wheeled from place to place in a wheelchair. So everybody's in the amphitheater. They're all sitting there waiting for the Dr. Deming to show up and he gets wheeled in and, and it's a very awkward moment because you know, what in the hell do you do? How do you open this up? How do you say something to start with? And so Vin is always a wonderful facilitator and he said, well, <clears throat> Dr. Deming, we've been concerned about cost in healthcare. Do you have some recommendations for us about how we might take cost out of healthcare? <laughs> Deming, who, who at that time was um, struggling with the partial plate that he had in his uh, upper uh, upper plate, and then obviously he was working with his tongue, tongue to hold the plate up a little bit, and he and he had this deep bass voice. And he said, "Well, I suppose you could stop taking care of people like me." <laughs> well, what? What, what do you do? What do you do with that? I mean, you've now got a whole amphitheater full of people, and the truth has just been spoken. I mean, in a, in a very real way, and yet, how would you want to deal with? It? Well, see, Arnie is trying to sort of reframe that a little bit, it's suggesting that what we've got to do here is really a complex task. This is going to take redesign. This isn't just cutting two nurses. Or, or, or cutting a couple of hours out or, or deferring sort of the purchase of an IV pump. This is a redesign challenge. Well, this is tricky. This is tricky. And I, when, I, when I realized this, I began to think about some of the models for thinking about value creation. Michael Porter's work on value chains and, and sort of how, how, how you sort of should do this before you do that, and then you do that, and then it comes out at the end. And, you know, that's okay for if our job is to make these things. But if our job is to care for people, that value chain thinking may not be all that's needed. And I, so I was kind of restless about that. And Clayton Christensen at, at Harvard had conspired with these two Norwegians, Charles Stavell and Oysten Fjellsted, about 
Innovator's Prescription for Healthcare Reform. And, and so since he wrote the whole book about what these two Norwegians had written, I decided to call the Norwegians and, and so to see if I could learn something about them. So I began my work with Oysten Fjellstedt a couple of years ago. And what Fjellstedt was saying was that there's actually multiple ways to create value. One of the ways is with these linked processes. And that really works for manufacturing and for sort of the construction of goods. Uh, but he said an another way of creating value is uh, what he called solution shops, where you take your car into the mechanic and in the mechanic's place on the premises where the mechanic works, the mechanic comes up with a diagnosis and institutes a remedy. A solution is created, a customized solution is created. And he said there's a third way of creating value, which is uh, with a facilitated network, where you take people who, who are um, common customers of the same service or product and you hook them up. And I started to think about that as it related to healthcare. And I realized that, well, linked processes would be where we wanted to offer reliable treatment that's based on empirical established steps. Solution shops are where we want to offer professionally customized solutions. And facilitated networks are where we want to uh, facilitate the connections for people and resources that are interested in and that are relevant for the co-production of healthcare service. And I started to think about that a little bit, and gosh, you know, the, the IT requirements are really different. So for linked processes, we want to know whether the, the sequencing occurred the way it was supposed to. Did A happen before B, or didn't it? And for solution shops, was the current science easily and readily available, a click away? Or was it possible for somebody to, to consider multiple options to achieve best fit between problem and uh, what's available, and the facilitated network needed to get the right people in, keep the thieves out, uh, have good, good information moving around have, a, a, instead of junk, um, Facebook style. So, so part of the challenge here, because um, I started to think about Epic and the investments we're making in health record technology today. They don't help us with this stuff. Oh my God. I mean, that's, there's billions of dollars being spent in this deal. Information technology hasn't yet gotten to the place where we may need it to be in healthcare. If we're really concerned about improving value. Well, and, and in reality, of course, there's multiple systems that are involved. I mean, one system is embedded within another. There's the individual self-care system, the individual patient professional care system, the clinical microsystem where multiple professionals come together, and, or the mesosystems or the macrosystems and so, so on. And, and Brian Quinn at, at Dartmouth is saying, at the top of the organization are the front lines. <laughs> at the top of the organization is the front line. So if, if you have um, uh, chest pain on a ski hill, outside of Dartmouth, and you go, uh, you're, you're fetched by uh, the ambulance, and you go to the ED, then you move to the cath lab, to the coronary care unit, and then the step-down unit. The microsystems have to work well together. And what supports their working well together are the middle stuff, the mesosystems. And at the um, macro system level, the top leaders or I guess not top. Well, maybe they're just the macro system leaders. They're neither top nor bottom, but they in fact are the macro system leaders, calling it what they are. And the governing boards are uh, intended with the flag, but it's, it's different leadership work at each level. The value creating work occurs at the front lines. The enabling strategies come at the mesosystems and the aim and the context setting occurs at the macro system level. All really important work, very different leadership work, but all very important. So how, what might this look like at a real place? So um, we, a, a group of us were writing this book uh, on this triangle. Uh, we did it over two years. We talked every six weeks, and it's a group of authors, one of whom was Jim Anderson, who was the CEO at Cincinnati Children's. 
And uh, so I'm just taking this little excerpt from his chapter. So this is from Robin Cotton, who's the head of the ear, nose, and throat um, uh, unit at uh, Cincinnati Children's. And uh, Robin said to Jim, well, for the first part of my time here, any improvements that occurred came because I overcame the system. You, you don't have to be in many gatherings of physicians to know that most physicians think their job is to protect patients from the system. It's the same thinking that's going on here. Uh, for the first part of my time, any improvements that occurred came because I overcame the system. For the last part of my time here, they came because of the system. For the last part of my time, they came because of the system. And I asked Jim, well, how did that happen? Well, all right, so this is not an effort to get as many words as possible on a slide, but I wanna try to get what Jim said in front of us. And so I've tried to put it on a slide and I'll work my way through it slowly so that we understand what he said. Jim said, well, first you gotta work the whole triangle. You can't just work part of it. You can't just work a corner. You gotta work the whole triangle. Second point, we need a shared compelling vision with energy and its mission and strategic plan that's informed by data, not driven by it. And action with both accountability and transparency. I mean, this guy's a pro. He's a lawyer too, it irritates me. That, uh, he, he said, we needed to have hardwire, predictable operating mechanisms that foster agility. We need a single hierarchy with obligations to serve and with accountability for results. We need to invite and institutionalize boundaryless thinking, risk-taking, transparency, small tests of change, not business as usual. We need to set high expectations for everyone. We need to transform organizational structures so that they reflect priorities. We need to base the organization's vision and mission and strategic plans and actions on the values that draw people to healthcare. We need to enable colleagues to deliver their best, creating an environment where all have justified absolute faith in the institutional commitment to delivering the best. And then the last, we need to do it. My sense is that what Jim has encapsulated in just these few points is a graduate degree in health leadership. It's just a spectacular framing, I think, and that's why I think it's worth all these words on a slide. My sense is that uh, what uh, Jim was describing was the creation of a system that enabled the continual improvement of healthcare. So there are some of you here that are uh, that do research. So let me sort of play with that a little bit. So if you take the same triangle, and if you want to sort of do research on it, uh, you can do research on the corners. So you can, lots of questions that you can pursue about each corner, what the content, what the ingredients are. You can work on the lines, the hookups, how, how these things are connected throughout there. And so there's, there's lots of research opportunity about whether this thing is really a good model or useful or whether it's uh, just kind of an idle dream. My suggestion is that uh, if we're going to develop the science of this getting better, this science of improving health care, uh, we need to make some more explicit connections. And I want to just touch on a few of those before I sort of bring this to a merciful conclusion. Um, first point, making and studying an improvement are two different things. Okay. And uh, uh, I think that uh, science, uh, according to this guy, Vandenbroek, who's a clinical trialist at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, who wrote in the Public Library of Science in March 2008, we regularly confuse science as equal to effectiveness and assessment. He said that's one really important job of science. And we know the methods and the hierarchy of the methods that are helpful there. Nothing better than a randomized controlled trial for doing effectiveness assessment. And a well-described case report can only get you so far. Uh, he said, however, science is not the same as effectiveness assessment. Science also includes discovery and explanation. And there, the methods 
in their order of helpfulness are just reversed from the methods hierarchy in effectiveness and assessment. What's maybe the most helpful in explanation or in discovery is a well-described case report. He said basically both contribute to science. So as we develop the science of improving healthcare and we recognize that making and studying improvement are different, the questions are different. How did you improve what you improved would be legitimate question for inquiry into making an improvement. But how did you study the improvement process and outcomes is legitimate for inquiry into studying improvement. And it's the same formula that we use uh, uh, for making an improvement, but when we try to apply that in the social settings, the real, the real settings of healthcare, um, Trish Greenhalgh, a family physician in London, and uh, uh, Ray Pawson, a, an, an evaluation researcher at the University of Leeds, said that uh, when, you, when, when you're trying to make a change in a real situation, a real social situation, you got to pay attention to some things. The first of those is that the interventions, the changes, actually involve theories, but they're often not explicit. So people don't talk about what their theory is. I mean, they're trying this because underneath they think this will make that happen, but they don't say it. So they don't say, I think if we do this, that will happen, and the reason I think that is because that sort of opens a little vulnerability because you know maybe you didn't think well. So being clear about the theory that we actually are using or what our hunches are, what the logic model is that we're using becomes one very important way of trying to uh, improve the science. It, the second point they said is that in a social situation, social context, any effects that are achieved are achieved by individuals. So you don't want to control out the news about so what somebody did to make it work. You actually want to know everything you can about what they did to do to make it work. Because that's relevant. We want to understand that. The success, if it's going to be successful, occurs because there's a sequence of things that happen. So you actually want to know whether there was a weak link in the succession of stuff that ought to happen. And the implementation change themselves are not linear. So what can happen right in the middle is you go back to start one and you go over again. So, so it's this recursive character to any kind of real social change. Real social change happens in the midst of a whole bunch of social systems. So this social system is right a neighbor to that social system, which is a neighbor to that social system, and they all impact one another. And so the way they're working, you have to understand. You can't just sort of pretend that it's all going to happen by itself. And we got this other problem here, which is that unlike when you study the effect of a pill on a disease state, uh, the effect of the social change on the clinic or the hospital changes the clinic or the hospital and it also changes the change. So what's going on is that there's a property called recursiveness, I mean reflexivity, where what happens is that the intervention is changing the context it's intervening in. And so you have this interesting problem of how to study the damn thing because now it didn't hold still. The system didn't hold still while you introduced this. And you have to understand that. We can't shy from that and pretend that it's different just for purposes of writing a paper. And so we have this problem of, of taking action in complex social systems and coming to grips with what that actually means. But we use the same formula here, but now when we're studying this, we're making an object of this. This isn't just us living in the midst of it. It's now the object of our study. And what we're looking for are the elements and the way they, in fact, are uh, interacting one with another and the way they come together and their effectiveness and their value. And oftentimes, we're not just doing a single intervention. We're doing a bunch of interventions. And we're now looking at the way that works. This is an area of real scholarship that we need in healthcare to try to address this problem of better value. So for me, the science of better health, better care, and best value, and better professional development includes the models, the methods, the metrics that create the underlying discipline and knowledge 
that allow both discovery and assessment of what's effective, that foster good system design and redesign, and that invite rigorous scholarly work that crosses disciplinary and professional lines. What I've tried to do is to open up a model, a way of thinking about the relatedness of system improvement and professional development and population outcome. I think those things have to stay together if we expect creative, generative, sustainable work on improving healthcare. But I'm curious, so what might be the next actions to take for you to help develop sustainably better value in healthcare? Thank you. Oh, of course. You can find the mic. Yeah, it's here. And you know how to turn it on? Yeah, I know how to turn it on. I had a short lesson in turning it on. Here we go. Yeah. Right, right. In healthcare, I find amongst the irrational outcomes, my atherogenic disease being the third leading cause of death in this country, mm -hmm. I find amongst the uh, irrational outcomes the monopoly over medical knowledge to 126 medical schools that, in which only 6% of the working class is employed. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that, I mean, there's any number of things that I, I would, could comment on in what you said, because I love many of the things you've said as a springboard to sort of riff on. But let me, let me just focus on the question at the end. Uh, because I think that um, what I've learned as a change agent is to consult with lawyers after. <laughs> after doing what I think is right. Because if you consult with lawyers before you do what you think is right, they will find a reason to scare the living daylights out of you. And you won't try doing what you think is right. And my experience has been that you usually uh, are just fine. Are you protected? No. Are you doing the right thing in a sense that gives you joy in your work and meaning in your life? Yes. And my sense is that we have this deep, deep kind of responsibility to make healthcare better. And we can't shy away from potential risks. We need to be mindful of them. But we shouldn't uh, sort of let that litigious uh, character of our current society get in the way of efforts to make this system better. We know better, we can do better, and we deserve better. And I think that we mobilize the community by more openness and more conversation, not by less openness and less conversation. So I cast my lot there, but I know that it's risky. It's not risky in the sense that uh, it's uh, paralytic for me, but it's risky so that I'm vigilant. But I go ahead. And it's exactly what I think we need to do. So I, I mean, the other stuff you're talking about, I, I believe we're moving to a time when 
when we're, be, we're soon going to be able to tell the truth that health is not created by health professionals. Health is created by people. Health professionals' job is to remove the barriers that sort of stand in the way of, remo of removing the, 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 the burdens of illness in people's lives. Co-production of health is really the only way it happens. It's the only way it's ever happened. And so part of the challenge of doing that is to move beyond rhetoric and talking about patient centrism and start to be meaningfully engaged in the development of competencies for the co-production of healthcare. I mean, it isn't, it, it, people don't automatically come competent to engage in the co-production of care. And professionals uh, can do things to help that, and patients can do things to help that. And as a society, we can work on how those things interact. So I think a lot of what you say um, is accurate and I think nicely describes the past. And so the challenge for me is to try to anticipate the future. I accept the, the validity of your, of your conclusions as I look back and as I look at the present and what has gotten us here. But going forward, I see other things that make me really a lot more hopeful. I mean, the movement of information out of hierarchies into much more open relationships now means that when somebody comes to see you in the office, they, they haven't just for the first time thought about this if they've had this problem. They're pretty knowledgeable. They've, they're web savvy. I mean, when it first started, people would describe at the Mayo Clinic, when I was rotating at the Mayo Clinic as a senior medical student, uh, a common kind of thing was to say this patient was internet positive. And what that meant was, be prepared. I mean, geez, they're going to have a lot of questions. But today, we don't think that way. I mean, we're beyond that now. We expect people to have access to and use information, and we want to encourage that. And that's moving to a very different relationship between professionals and their organizations and the people who receive benefit. And so my view is that we, we actually do healthcare work in systems where professionals and patients are part of the same system. It isn't a professional system that's doing something for patients, it's professionals and patients doing something to reduce the burden of illness. And that's a very different framing of the nature of professional work, which I think will get at some of those other conclusions that I think you were suggesting. But Is there any other organizational realm outside of medicine that you would see as a um, Well, I think what's happening in education uh, is um, an example of, uh, in, yesterday I was meeting with a group of students who actually had decided that they wanted to organize some of their learning in an open school chapter here. Why did they want to do that? Well, because they actually wanted to learn in ways and about stuff that they weren't getting in classes. Or what's going on now in the MOOCs, in the various kind of open classroom stuff, or what the Khan Academy is doing in, in uh, the poor parts of the world. I mean, there's, there's a revolution at work here. The world that's being created, the world under construction is not just exactly the world I want, but there are themes in that world under construction that are pretty exciting, I think, and can be built on. But it's more than one life career space. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Hi, my name is Stephen Ricker. I'm one of the healthcare administration students here. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank you for coming and speaking at our university. Uh, my question is kind of maybe a little vague and a little simplistic, but it's been spoken to us a lot that you know, we need to learn to uh, have a clinical background and get so that sort of experience. And you also spoke a lot to uh, that leadership is very important for healthcare improvement. Right. Do you think that it would be uh, very beneficial for healthcare improvement having clinicians and pharmacists go through leadership courses and things? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, basically, I don't view the work as the property of a single discipline. The work of change in healthcare simply has to occur, occur, and the various disciplines can bring their contributions to it. But to think that any discipline, any kind of brand of health professional, has a hammerlock on the task that's at hand is misleading. I mean, let, let me just give you an example. So I was working on clinical process cost analysis at Dartmouth. I came, when I came to Dartmouth 20 years ago, I said, I only want one staff person that's an accountant. And they said, what? 
And I said, yeah, I just want an accountant. I, I, want, to, I want to do clinical process cost analysis. What the hell is that? I said, well, I just want to understand the cost of the process. Well, maybe you already have that information. So I went to the CFO. You want to do what? I can tell you what the costs are. I said, no, you can tell me what's on your cost analytic sheets. You can't tell me the cost. I want to understand the cost of the process. I want to understand how we, if we change the process, we could do it at less cost. Oh, we can't, Paul, we can't begin, we can't begin to get that information. And I'm thinking to myself, well, who the hell can? I mean, if, if the finance support can't help us in this task, how are we going to get better? So um, I was busy getting in for, I'm, I'm a pediatrician. I was busy trying to help the place figure out what the process costs were with the help of an accountant. But I mean, it was not, it, I wasn't chief of any kind of thing. I was simply trying to understand. So an example of this was the pediatrics department, the, the chief of the pediatric department, John Brooks came to me and he said, Paul, we really, just did a fantastic deal with the crippled children's program in the state. We're gonna be the reference point for all of the crippled children's care for the cleft lip and palate kids in the state of New Hampshire. And I said, it's great, John. And he said, we negotiated this blanket payment arrangement, which is fantastic. And I said, well, John, would you mind if we just did a clinical process cost analysis of the steps that are involved in what you're gonna do? Oh, he said, no problem at all, I'd love, love to see that. Well, we did it. And what we found was that the preparation of the consolidated report of the visit cost one and a half times what he was being paid. No victory, <laughs> no victory. So part of the challenge was he said, you know, geez, I didn't know that. I mean, we can change the way we do that darn report. I mean, this, we can figure that out. We don't have to spend all that, bingo. See, it, this is the work that has to go on. We just have to get on with it and, and, and not pretend that it's somebody's, somebody's job or somebody else's job and therefore I don't have a reason to get on with it. I mean, it's your curiosity and your creativity that's gonna make it happen. So I, I, I'm eager for the task and eager to get on with it and eager to encourage people from different disciplines because each discipline brings a different set of lenses to look at the thing and those are helpful. I think. Yeah. One of the themes that uh, came up in the presentation was that data informs but doesn't drive. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the difference? You mentioned that in the context yeah. of the strategic plan. Well, I see Jim's a lawyer who knows the truth of what I was saying. You know, you have to do what's right, cool. and then you go talk to the lawyer about it. You you don't sort of you don't first talk to the lawyer. And so what Jim was, in his way, a lawyer saying, he said, you know, data is informing what we have to do. We have to decide what we have to do, and we have to do it. Data isn't gonna play this kind of role of sort of deciding, and we're gonna do everything with data. So here's this wonderful situation. In the UK right now, they, 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 they do health policy in the UK sometimes by what people call the tombstone, the tombstone method. So they wait for some disaster then they commission a public inquiry, and the public inquiry takes uh, input for a period of months, publishes a humongous report, and then they build a tombstone on top of the whole thing, and they can refer to it. So what's going on right now in the UK is the Mid-Staffordshire scandal, and the public inquiry commission leader was Robert Francis, an attorney. So the Francis Report is available. You can Google that and go after the Francis Report. It has three volumes. It's 1,400 pages. The executive summary is 126 pages long. There are 192 recommendations. This hospital trust has been busy following the performance metrics that were laid out by the health ministry with the financial targets intended to bring about correct behavior and allowing patients to lie in their bone feces and force patients to get their drinking water from vases with flowers in them. This is outrageous. 
It's an example where people believed that data could drive the proper response. That's what Jim was saying is not true. That just isn't right, he said. We need to do what's right. Data should inform what we do. Data should not drive it. But his point is that there's a role for a person who's able to make a judgment here, a bandwidth that's big enough to recognize another human being and not sort of reduce it the way measurement reduces things. Measurement, after all, is a reductive art. And we can't, we can't make mistakes about that. This stuff we're doing is too important. So I, I think basically what Jim is talking about is the way I understand it, I and mean, we should ask him, but I mean that's the way I understand the, the distinction he's making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested at the end of reflexivity you were talking about. Reflexivity, yeah. Reflexivity. reflexivity, yeah. And where do I find information on it? All our students are experiencing that. Yeah. They yeah. They're making these changes in right. the wild force. Right, right, right. Well, there's a lot um, that's written in largely in the sociological literature about that and the evaluation of that. There's a book that has recently come out about evaluation study, reflexive methods in evaluation studies. And I'll get you that, I don't have the, it's a Swedish author and somebody else that, it, 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 that that's the best single place to start, I think. But I think you could find other references. I bet you would know some other places to learn about reflexivity. Where else might somebody go to learn about reflexivity, the property of reflexivity? Because it's actually a well-written, uh, uh, writ written about phenomenon in undertaking change. Um, yeah. Oh, I understand. I understand. Oh, yeah, I understand. I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. And um, Trish Greenhalgh is the is the person in the UK, the family physician in London, who who's trying to single-handedly preserve primary care for London, so she's a busy lady. And uh, she, she, though, is a marvelous writer and very clear writer about uh, this stuff. And uh, she um, may, I, I'll find, you, you give me your card, I'll get you something about that, because it's a thing that I've been really curious about. And we're trying to address that in the Squire Guidelines, because one of the problems, one of the problems is that when we started the Squire Guidelines, we thought much in much more traditional terms about interventions and the stability of the context in which these interventions are put. And uh, we're trying to take a pill for that in the, in the second version of the Squire Guidelines, which we're working on right now. Oh, good. So. Because it really is a problem. You know, we want yeah. to have the student prepare the yeah. whole system's yeah. assessment. Yeah. I, I think the place I would begin is to uh, um, uh, sort of work at noticing what's happening. Sim simply encourage people to, to look to the left and look to the right, look above and look below uh, where you are doing what you're doing and pay attention to the way the context is evolving as you're doing what you're doing and note that. Don't, don't sort of not note that and that sort of in the field study way that an anthropologist might look at it is, is sort of the way I would start. But I, I should have a better answer than that. You, you give me your card and I'll, I'll find you a better answer than that. Okay? Okay. You read a point. Yeah, I have one. Uh, I'm just going to go to the University of Arizona, Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, we've got approval to build with a new hospital and a new medical school at the University of Texas at Austin mm -hmm. in the next three, four years. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if we've got this opportunity to really build the hospital and medical school right. together. And the idea is, for them to share a campus and be connected with, with the University of Texas. So as we got this opportunity to look right. hospital right. and medical school, right. if you've got a recommendation, I'm, I'm on the hospital administration, colleagues right. on the other side, right. but how can that integrate with oh, that good goal. What, what a great... It, it might be too big of a question. Oh, no, no, it's a great question. I love it, I love it, I love it. So, so the, the, the two places that I think are, are working right now in some very creative ways about uh, professional educational curriculum. And the first place I go is Long Island Jewish. 
and uh, the work that they're doing, where basically the nurses are writing the medical school curriculum and the physicians are writing the nursing school curriculum. And uh, the administration of the hospital is working on creating a very different idea so that medical students first have to become uh, EMTs. So they, they can't go to medical school before they've ridden the ambulance and cared for people in immediate need. So they, they start medical school with a very real understanding of what the world is asking of healthcare in a very interesting way. So that's one place to go. Uh, I think what they're doing at Dartmouth is actually, now that I'm not involved with that, I, I think that's really worth trying to understand because that's a change in the curriculum. That's a fundamental change, this integration of these three different threads. But the third point to make about this is the, the work that uh, these two guys at uh, the Tuck School at uh, Dartmouth, they, they've studied innovation in, for 10 years and they've, and they've looked at, it's, it's Govinda Jaran and Chris Tremble's book about beyond, beyond innovation and it's the execution of innovation. And they talk about the relationship of um, uh, seed activities that are innovative and the relationship of those to, quotes, parent or um, spawning grounds for innovation and what the nature of the interaction ought to be. Um, and they've written both a, a scholarly book about it and a, and a sort, of, sort of a children's fable kind of book. Um, and uh, the Children's Fable book is out now. It's a fun place to start with it. And it just talks about um, some sheep and a threat to the farm and stuff like that. But it's, it's kind of a fun uh, way to, to open it up and, and, and open the conversation. But those three things are things that come to my mind. That's a wonderful opportunity. Don't lose it. Yeah, yeah. Here's one. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you, under this model, do you think there's a particular delivery model that works best, whether it be an ACO, you know, medical home, that, 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 that uses this model most efficiently? Because I feel like there's some yeah. ways of delivering medicine that this would work better than others. So I don't know what you think. Well, I don't know. I mean, my sense is that uh, no model has a hammer lock. Um, no way of delivering care has a hammerlock on doing this well. And by the same token, no, no model of delivering care needs to remain agnostic about this. I mean, they actually could, any one of them, embrace this. But it does require leadership. It does require people to get it. And um, this isn't a matter of sort of going to a very rarefied headhunter and finding the perfect person. This is a matter of people recognizing that there's a lot of sad health professionals today. And uh, that, that, that basically don't, don't feel very good about coming to work. And they, that's because of the way that their work is connected to the workplace in which they're working. And it's not because the people at the, uh, in the leadership roles in those systems at the macro system level are setting out to create a lousy place to work, they're trying to respond to what they perceive to be the social challenges. And I would submit that as long as we sort of don't put substantial redesign in the center in front of us, we're just gonna end up with this kind of, well, let me see if you can get along without this finger. Well, actually it's this finger and that finger. Well, now that, I've just got those two fingers. Could you, could you borrow one of my, uh, could I take one of your toes? And we keep whittling away as if there was an unlimited whittling that would bring about the changes that society is asking for. And I think that's an illusion. De um, I mentioned yesterday in the, in, the, in the open school thing that Bill Coffin, uh, Reverend William Sloan Coffin um, was a guest uh, lecture at Vanderbilt in, in the Peabody School and this kid got up and shuffled up to the microphone he says, oh, Dr. Coffin, I'm so disillusioned. What do you say to that? And Bill Coffin said, who the hell gave you the right to be illusioned in the first place? Without missing a beat. Who the hell gives us the right to be illusioned that the current forms just need to be tweaked? 
responsible for it.